Welcome to the Redefining Mormonism video. In this video, we will compare common definitions of words to Mormon leaders and apologist definitions of the same words. And you'll see what I'm talking about as we go through the slides. Let's get started here with a quote from Carrie Mullestein, LDS apologist, 2014 Fair Mormon Conference. He said, I start out with an assumption that the Book of Abraham and the Book of Mormon and anything else we get from the restored gospel is true. So that's his starting assumption. Therefore, any evidence that I find, I will try and fit into that paradigm. I'm not going to go into a lot of context on these terms. I would encourage you to Google the information that you find in these slides. I could spend a video uh, probably on uh, each one of these slides. But just Google it to get more context. I will give a brief summary. Okay, the common definition of translate, to express the sense of words or text in another language. And here we have a smartphone translating one language into another. Makes sense, right? Okay, so as Joseph Smith has gotten in trouble with his translations, Mormon apologists have had to redefine the word translate. Now they're saying, oh, it's inspiration. It's a catalyst. It's revelation. Translate just means tell a story or even to meditate or reflect. So they've completely redefined this word in many instances. And above we see a person meditating. Okay, here we have a horse. Now it seems like we're in kindergarten again, doesn't it? But anyway, the definition of a horse is a large plant-eating domesticated mammal with solid hoofs and a flowing mane and tail used for riding, racing, and to carry and pull loads. But no, in the Book of Mormon, the apologists don't want us to take the common definition for horse. Since there were no horses in Book of Mormon times, Mormon apologists have redefined the word horse to mean taper. And here are two examples of tapers, and you can see the size of them compared to a man. Okay, the next one is steel. And there was no steel in Book of Mormon times in the Americas. But anyway, steel is a hard, strong, gray or bluish gray alloy of iron with carbon and usually other elements. It's used extensively as a structural and fabricating material. Makes sense, right? But since there was no steel during Book of Mormon times, Mormon apologists define steel as a copper alloy or bronze. That is not steel, folks. Okay, back around 1980, there was a guy named Mark Hoffman. And he was coming up with some forged documents. And in one of those documents, he said that when Joseph Smith opened up the box where the golden plates were, a salamander jumped out and became a man. And uh, this became kind of a controversial document for the church. But anyway, the word salamander means, in the common sense, a lizard-like amphibian with an elongated body and tail and short limbs. But since the word salamander was kind of controversial for the church, Dallin H. Oaks wanted to emphasize another definition for salamander, which is a real definition, but it just shows how they're doing mental uh, gymnastics here. And the other definition that Dallin wanted everybody to, to think of was a mythical being thought to be able to live in fire. Definitely not the common definition of salamander, but it maybe got a little bit of the heat off of the church's back. Okay, polygamy. The common definition, the practice or custom of having more than one wife or husband at the same time. So it can go either way. But of course the church wants to redefine the term wife and redefine the term polygamy to mean non-sexual eternal ceilings. So your wife is just a non-sexual eternal ceiling. Okay, the term prophet, and this is the LDS.org definition. It is a person who has been called by and speaks for God. As a messenger of God, a prophet receives commandments, prophecies, and revelations from God. His responsibility is to make known God's will and true character to mankind and to show the meaning of his dealings with them. Okay, so as Joseph Smith gets in trouble and it seems like he's not acting like a prophet, and it seems like his prophecies fail, the Mormon apologists will just redefine the word prophet and say that it is anyone working to improve the world, really general, or he's just an instrument 
or he's a policymaker or a fallible administrator and a man. So sometimes he acts as a man, sometimes as a prophet, but he's just a fallible administrator. So this is the way they deal with, with this kind of stuff. Okay, the gift of discernment, the ability to judge well. Are you lost, confused, perplexed, disoriented? Well, if you have the gift of discernment, you will know what to do and you will judge well. Okay, so when Mark Hoffman brought some forged documents to the prophet and some apostles, did they have the gift of discernment to tell if they were real or if they were forged? So here you see Spencer W. Kimball, the prophet, looking at some of these documents and some of the other guys looking down. This is a photo from 1980 in the Desert News. And they did not have the gift of discernment. They bought up these documents to keep them off the market and uh, wanted to put them in their vaults. Okay, chariots are mentioned several times in the Book of Mormon, but there were no chariots during Book of Mormon times. But the common definition is a two-wheeled horse-drawn vehicle used in ancient warfare and racing. Makes sense, right? But since there were no chariots in Book of Mormon times, the Mormon apologists redefined the word chariot, and they call it a mythic or cultic wheeled vehicle mythic or cultic i really couldn't find a picture of what they're talking about but this seems to apply here this above picture okay dowsing rod and sprout these were terms that were used in the book of commandments which later became the doctrine and covenants common definition is a rod usually a forked hazel twig see the picture above said to move or dip when held above the ground in which water metal gold etc is to be found these words were related to magic and Joseph Smith's early treasure digging so they didn't really like these words so Mormon editor in the Doctrine and Covenants redefined the word dowsing rod and said it was the gift of Aaron and this is in regard to Oliver Cowdery so he no longer had the gift of the rod but he had the gift of Aaron who was a supporter of Moses so maybe Joseph was just telling uh, Oliver to be a supporter of him so you would think that this is an easy one here a 14 year old girl uh do i really need to give the definition duh but since joseph smith married a 14 year old girl the church kind of wanted to get away from saying 14 year old and saying 15 year old instead this in the lds gospel topics essay on plural marriage in kirtland and nauvoo they said that a 14 year old girl was several months before her 15th birthday so it looks just a little bit better 15 looks a little better than 14, a little bit less controversial, but aren't we really splitting hairs here? Bearing false witness, speaking falsely in any matter, lying, equivocating, and any way devising and designing to deceive our neighbor. Proverbs 19.9, Exodus 20.16. But we have a few examples of Mormons bearing false witness. One is when little kids who can't even read or write get up and bear their testimony, testifying of things they don't know but hope are true. And that could even apply to adults too. Things you don't know, things that you really haven't researched but you just hope they're true, that is an example of bearing false witness. And also Mormon apologetics in general, they like to really stretch the, tr stretch the truth, mislead people, and I would even say lie. Okay, witness, one who testifies to what he or she has seen. So like an eyewitness, what you have seen with your real eyes. But back when the Book of Mormon came out, it was really common to say that you see things in your mind's eye, not with your physical eyes. So if you really start studying the witnesses of the Book of Mormon, you will see that many of them meant that they saw it in their mind's eye, not with their physical eyes. So they've changed the definition of the word witness. Okay, Brigham Young talked about Adam being our God, being our Heavenly Father, and he said it was a doctrine. Okay, that's Brigham Young's terms. But since this was a very controversial teaching, later general authorities wanted to get away from the adam god doctrine and started calling it the adam god theory they started to do apologetics and you can look these up online uh, statements by bruce r mcconkey spencer w kimball who redefined doctrine as just being a theory which uh, brigham young was wrong about 
Okay, steel swords. Seems easy enough to define, right? A steel sword is a bladed weapon intended for slashing or thrusting that is longer than a knife or dagger, consisting of a long blade attached to a hilt. So see the picture. The problem was there was no steel in Book of Mormon times. But since they haven't found any steel swords during Book of Mormon times and Book of Mormon lands, Mormon apologists have redefined the words steel sword and have said, oh, maybe it was an Aztec Makahutl. I'm not sure how to say that. Or a Makana. See the picture above. It's more like a club, a wooden club, and it has obsidian rocks put in the sides of it. Okay, the definition of apostle. Each of the 12 chief disciples of Jesus Christ. Simple answer found on Google. But now the general authorities look more like business executives in their shirts, ties, and jackets. Looks like they would fit into any boardroom across corporate America. All right, eternal doctrine, lasting or existing forever. But since the church has had a lot of doctrine that has changed, we're going to have to redefine it. Mormon apologists have redefined the term eternal doctrine to mean current practice or following the current prophet. Bruce R. McConkie said plural marriage is not essential to salvation or exaltation. But Brigham Young said the only men who become gods, even the sons of God, are those who enter into polygamy. And it is essential. So which one speaks for God? Which one speaks for man? Don't worry about it. Just follow the current practice and the current prophet and you'll be fine. All right, Abraham, per Joseph Smith in facsimile 1, figure 2, see the red arrow above, the guy lying there on the lion couch, was Abraham, and he was about to be sacrificed by Elkanah. But Mormon apologists have had to redefine who is lying on the lion couch, and they identified the person as whore. Because every other Egyptologist in the world identified the person lying on the couch as whore. So they had to come up with a different apologetic. So people like Michael D. Rhodes finally had to admit that, yeah, that's whore lying on the couch. And that is Anubis above him. All right, the definition of scripture. According to Google, it is simply a sacred text, the Bible, or the Word of God. All right, Mormon leader or apologist definition of scripture. Something the spirit bears witness of, whether true or false. So if you start studying the scholarship of the Book of Mormon or the Book of Abraham and you, you find controversial things that seem to indicate that Joseph Smith didn't translate it and that he was wrong about his translation and other things, the leaders and the apologists will just say, well, you need to pray and get the spirit of the Holy Ghost to bear witness of whether it is true or false. What the scholarship says does not matter. So go to Moroni 10.5, and by the power of the Holy Ghost, ye may know the truth of all things. But it's really not true. It's an emotional response, and you can have spiritual, emotional experiences in or out of the church and re reading all kinds of different books. All right, the first Hill Cumorah here is simply where Moroni buried the plates and he said the last great battle in the Book of Mormon took place. And it was in Joseph Smith's backyard, basically, in Manchester, New York. And Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery just seemed to say uh, that the Hillcomer was there. And that just seemed to be common knowledge. But since there's more ruins down in Guatemala or Mexico, Mormon apologists have said, well, maybe the Hillcomer was down there in Central America or Mexico because there's more ruins down there. And go against the common sense of what Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery seem to believe, and create this whole new theory of geography. Well then, how did the plates get up into Manchester, New York, to where Joseph Smith could find them? All right, who were the Lamanites? Well, prior to 2006 and the introduction of the Book of Mormon, they said the Lamanites were the principal ancestors of the American Indians, the principal. So most of the people living over here in the Americas were the ancestors of the people who came out of Jerusalem who were actually Jews, but then they turned into the American Indians. But then we were able to get DNA evidence to see where the people of the Americas actually came from. And now we know, based on the DNA evidence, 
that they came from Asia and crossed the land bridge as shown on this map. And that's how they got here. They didn't come by boat and they didn't come from Jerusalem and they were not Jews. So we now know they were not the principal ancestors. So in the Book of Mormon after 2006, in the introduction, the leaders of the church have had to redefine who the Lamanites are. And they are now saying the Lamanites are among the ancestors of the American Indians. So it's now a limited ge geography theory and they have to go against what the early Mormon saints and Joseph Smith actually believed. Okay, what is a cow? We're going back to kindergarten here. It is a large ruminant animal with horns and cloven hoofs, domesticated for meat or milk, or as beasts of burden. But since there were no cattle in Book of Mormon times, of course the apologists have had to redefine it. So the Mormon apologists define cattle now in certain papers as mountain goats or llamas because those actually did exist in Book of Mormon lands and Book of Mormon times. Seems pretty ridiculous. Okay, what is a revelation? Well, one definition is the divine or supernatural disclosure to humans of something relating to human existence or the world. That's pretty broad. But now we have seen church leaders getting revelation through polling data and surveys. So doing polls and doing surveys and boom, now we can get a revelation. Okay, let's define silk, a fine, strong, soft, lustrous fiber produced by silkworms. That's kind of important, silkworms, in making cocoons and collected to make thread and fabric. But of course, since there was no silk in Book of Mormon times, Mormon apologists have redefined silk as being kapok, which is this tree here, moth, cocoons, or silk grass. So the kapok makes this weird kind of uh, cottony stuff, and I guess that's what silk is. It doesn't come from silkworms anymore. Okay, polyandry, a form of polygamy in which a woman takes two or more husbands at the same time. So that's when a woman has two or more husbands. But since Joseph Smith took other men's wives, Mormon apologists have redefined the term polyandry to simply mean non-sexual eternal ceilings. So they redefine the term wife, redefine the term marriage, redefine the term polyandry. No sex was going on. And you can look at this slide here. Did Joseph Smith practice sexual polyandry? Many say yes. Uh, some say maybe and some say no. Okay, Leahona or compass. An instrument containing a magnetized pointer which shows the direction of magnetic north and bearings from it. Traditional definition of compass. But since it's impossible to have a compass in Book of Mormon times, Mormon apologists redefine the word compass as being an astrolabe or astrolab. I'm not sure how to say that, which must have been a more pre prehistoric instrument uh, similar to a compass. Okay, another common farm animal. And all these common farm animals would have been very familiar to Joseph Smith in the 19th century. All these strange animals that the uh, apologists are coming up with, he probably wasn't even familiar with, and he probably didn't even know they existed and wasn't thinking about them. Anyway, a sheep is a domesticated ruminant animal with a thick woolly coat and typically only in the male curving horns. It is kept in flocks for its wool or meat. But since there were no regular farm sheep in Book of Mormon times or places, Mormon apologists have defined sheep as being a bighorn sheep. Good luck domesticating one of those. Okay, another animal that Joseph Smith would be intimately aware of since they lived on farms in those days is a swine or a pig, which is an omnivorous domesticated hoofed mammal with sparse bristly hair and a flat snout for rooting in the soil, a snout for rooting in the soil, and is kept for its meat. They taste delicious. But since there was no domesticated farm pigs in Book of Mormon times, the apologists have defined swine as a peccary. Peccary, I think that's how you say that. And here is a picture of it. It's got big nasty teeth. Looks kind of like a pig. All right, a goat. Now, these were supposed to have existed in Book of Mormon times. It is a hardy, domesticated, ruminant animal 
that has backward curving horns and in the male a beard. It is kept for its milk and meat. Okay, and this is actually a pretty funny one. Since there were no goats, the Mormon apologist said that maybe it was a brocket deer. See the picture above, a brocket deer. That does not look like a goat. Okay, the term window is mentioned in the Book of Mormon. It is an opening in the wall or roof of a building or vehicle that is fitted with glass. They didn't have glass back then. Or other transparent material in a frame to admit light or air and allow people to see out. Okay, but since the word window is an anachronism in the Book of Mormon, of course the apologists have redefined it. And they have simply said that it is just an opening through which the wind could enter. No glass, no traditional window, just kind of a crack in the boat here. And these are the boats that the, that the Jaredites supposedly came across on. Okay, a scimitar, which is mentioned in the Book of Mormon, is a back sword or saber with a curved blade originating in the Middle East. But since they did not have metal or these kinds of swords in Book of Mormon times, apologists give a different definition for scimitar. It's something similar to the previous slide, something similar to a scimitar, but it is not made of metal. So maybe one of these machinas again that are like wooden clubs with obsidian. All right, and that will do it for this video. Remember the weird high priest guy. The apologist's answers are no more legitimate or official than his theories. So remember the apologists are not official, but the leaders and the prophet and the apostles don't like to speak out on these issues. They leave that to the unofficial apologists and the BYU professors. And I thank you for watching the Redefining Mormonism video.